Getting ahead of cataloging the games I've played has helped a lot with my organization, even outside of video games, and has also allowed for me to put this video out halfway through the year, instead of at the end. Because I feel that June is a better time for everything, right? A lot less stuff is really going on. It also allowed me to see that I got through quite a lot of games in 2019 so far, so let's talk about them. Before we start though, this list will only include games that I have not done a video slash videos about already, as well as games that I plan to make a video on in the future. So please check out the playlist to the games I played in 2019 available in the video description or at the end of this video. Without further ado, let's get started. I want to actually start with the rest of the Spiral Reignited trilogy, since I only focused on the first game in their specific videos. While I was looking forward to seeing the redesigns of all the dragons and what they were going to be for Spiral 1, Ripto's Rage and Year of the Dragon, over the years, for me, have turned into games I enjoy for different reasons. With the originals, I enjoyed them quite a lot, but now they mainly serve as a means to shut my brain off and relax which is a good thing in its own right. While there's nothing wrong with that, I remember a time when these games provided something more meaningful for me, however. Now I just kind of breeze through it without a passing glance, uninterested in what each world provides, ignoring dialogue, frustrated about the abilities you need to have that are unlocked later, requiring you to come back later, and forgetting the sorceress's existence for the 14th or 15th time by now. With the Crash Insane trilogy, I found a lot of quality of life improvements to bring the games up to speed with one another, which continue to make for an engaging experience. With Spyro, I see systems that are fairly stagnant or unrefreshed, while other systems, mainly the skateboarding and racing, were solid proofs of concept for Insomniac's next series, Ratchet and Clank. I find that the Spyro Reignited trilogy demonstrates to me that I have grown up a little more, become more experienced and observant of what I like and want to enjoy, and that this trilogy, as reignited as it is, is simply a snapshot of its own time, and not much more than that. Dreamles, and Dreamles Dream Quest. Dreamles are a pair of puzzle platformers revolving around three animals with limited movement. One moves left, or right, or only jumps. If they get in contact with each other, they combine their movement into a simple platform character. It's a neat system that allows for creative puzzle layouts and the addition of traps and obstacles such as boxes, fire, bombs, and evil versions of the animals makes the game that much better. The second game, Dream Quest, adds more to this formula by being able to separate the animals, which is a dimension that really stretched what my mind could take while focusing on everything else. The main problem gameplay-wise I have with both games, so they don't fix this in Dream Quest, is dealing with touching walls and corners of ledges, which can make jumps not work, jumps not go as high as they should, or cause your character to go backwards in awkward ways, which can help solve a few puzzles in unexpected ways, but it's not meant to actually work that way. The first game is fairly simple, with a bare bones story that does not need to be there really, could have been just a simple puzzle game and just focused on that. But Dream Quest, its story is something special. It's barely there too, except they set up the three animals with tragic events surrounding them, like hunters, woodsmen, and a forest fire, which causes the stag to be burned, the toucan having a broken leg and losing all her eggs, and the fox is shot and quote, gravely injured, and yet these characters go through the entire game with these injuries. I am not kidding, I'll repeat the note that the fox is about to die from his injuries and is going around solving puzzles in order for some rabbit to heal them all. As far as I remember, they don't even get healed until the end of the game too. This is such an unsettling element to the story. The dialogue, as little as there is, is also really standoffish and hostile as the animals also get yelled at, accused of things, and attacked more during the game. The story is so out of place for how little it actually matters. But if you're looking for a cute looking puzzle platformer which functions competently for cheap, check out these two games I guess. Like seriously, what the hell is happening? The Dragon's Lair Trilogy This includes Dragon's Lair, Dragon's Lair 2, Time Warp, and Space Ace, so you include that in the trilogy whenever you're actually going to purchase it. Talking about them all together at this point is better than separately, as comparisons can be drawn. 
I will always respect Dragon's Lair for its history, what it is, and where it led into the future, as well as being a forefather for, well, quick time events. If I were to rank them from worst to best, it would be Dragon's Lair 1, then 2, and Space Ace as the best. I can't really say that they have aged well, though. If you're wanting Don Bluth animation, there are better avenues, and I feel that Don Bluth's animation is better spent on slower adventures. Simply watching all the games, which you can do, shows how spastic and crazy the games actually are, with little thoroughfare between scenes. This is easy to see in the first Dragon's Lair, playing more arcade-based with randomized scenes you need to get through, but Dragon's Lair 2, while more linear, is also, well, bonkers. The addition of treasures is also divisive, prompting higher attention from the player, looking for sometimes small objects between prompts, and pressing the right button in order to collect it. You sometimes can't even see it, it's too chaotic what actually happens. Space Ace gets all of this under control the best, with options to energize and become buff, but you can get through Space Ace without energizing at all for different storyboard sequences. Also, personally, I'm a Kimberly fan. She's slightly deeper as a character than Daphne, and also accompanies you for a couple levels. And with this, you get a bit of back and forth. It's nice. There is a great video that dives into the legacy of Dragon Slayer from Mage Bomber Guy if you're interested in more and where Dragon Slayer went. Dive Kick. I'm not a fan of fighting games. So why did you play this then? Well, I am interested in what fighting games offer. What I don't like is usually the people I'm playing with, who know the game inside out and I'm button mashing like a pathetic baby. So dive kick should be great, right? It's only two buttons to play. Well, I agree, but I also disagree with that. I still suck at it, but I applaud how far a fighting game can go with just two buttons. I went ahead and played through all of the character story modes and learned about their angles of kicking, the height of their dives, and the combination of two buttons in order to perform special moves. There's a respectable amount of depth to what I think is still known as a parody of fighting games. And it gets a tentative thumbs up from me. Gunhouse. Gunhouse is pretty good. It's a combination of a tower defense game with block matching, with simple mechanics by sliding blocks around and loading your tower with guns and special abilities based on your equipped weapons. It's a simple system that works, especially when you can power up your weapons mid-round by stacking weapon blocks of the type over top of established guns and specials, resulting in devastating attacks. As you defeat enemies, you get money, which you purchase new weapons, upgrades, and health and armor extensions. A perk here is that with upgrades of any kind, you can refund them at any time, resulting in very little grinding, and you can change what your loadout is on the fly, and where your money goes, you have control of that, especially when completing the objectives the game gives you. Every three levels, you fight a boss and move on to the next day, until you reach day 10, and then the credits roll. And then I looked at the trophy list on my PS4 and noticed trophies for playing up to day 100. That would mean playing the game 10 times to fully complete it. It's really my only sour point with this game and shows how boring the game actually can really get. Because I have other things to do. So, Gunhouse, you were pretty good. But you were also fun while you lasted. A story about my uncle. Gone North Games, now Coffee Stain North, is mostly known for Goat Simulator, which exploded in 2014, part of Coffee Stain Studios, who also published it. Then, almost two months later, ASAMU, as it says at the top of my game window, came out, and people played it, referencing the developers as the Goat Simulator developers. I'll just say, making the change from a viral, stupid, fun game that's a joke of the simulator craze to a serious game that probably was supposed to come out beforehand can be relatable to producing any kind of consumable media in terms of popularity. Because a story about my uncle introduces problems, both from the game itself and being in the shadow of Goat Simulator. It is simplistic, for starters. It's a game revolving around momentum based on grappling hook mechanics, featuring huge environments to get across. If you get in the right mindset, a story about my uncle is pretty zen. I found a few annoyances when it comes to misunderstanding jump distances and where the momentum is really going to take you, 
aka expectations versus reality, but it's the story about my uncle part that bothers me more. Some of the delivery of the narration and voice acting aside, the story feels like it is stuck inside of a box. And there's something inside of that box. Another world of possibilities for where the story could go. But you can't open that box. And you're left unsatisfied. The ending of the story is really sweet, really. But the story leading to that moment does not contain enough weight or tension or even real stakes. And what I wish is for games like this to really think about whether or not hiding parts of the story away from players as collectibles is really a good idea. I feel a little empty after playing this, and I wish I didn't. Because the game shows in its beginning so much stuff, and to me, so much potential for a deep, involving adventure. Monster Hunter Stories When I first got my 3DS, I got the special edition Monster Hunter 4 Ultimate New Nintendo 3DS XL. Wow, that's a mouthful. Because one, it looks sick. And two, it served as an excuse to get one of the Monster Hunter games, and maybe finally learn what it's all about and get into it. And then that didn't happen. I barely scratched the surface of 4, and it fell by the wayside for me, and since Monster Hunter Generations, Double Cross, or Generations Ultimate, as it was called when it brought over to the Switch, and Monster Hunter World came out, the fanbase has moved on well past 4. And every time I try to watch Monster Hunter World being played by someone else on Twitch, I somehow find the time when everyone is in town doing nothing for 45 minutes instead of hunting monsters. Something is definitely wrong with my timing when it comes to watching Twitch streams, because I never get the most entertaining part of them. Anyway, I still had the goal that I needed a Monster Hunter game that can act as a gateway into the series, and what it contains, and whether or not it's actually going to be really fun for me. So I played Monster Hunter Pokemon Edition. Actually, scratch that, sorry. Monster Hunter Stories. The more traditionally focused RPG set in the Monster Hunter universe, with more of a focused story, and the ability to fight with monsters from the series. It is really well made, and for me, serves its purpose as an entry point into Monster Hunter. The story is relatively simple, with a great evil looming over the world that you will stop through traveling the world, and some of the characters are not all that fleshed out, Heck, some of them don't really get full character arcs and get pushed aside, but the world's attitude towards different walks of life and how they interact with each other like the writers, hunters, and to a lesser degree the Shriveners, build the solid foundation the game world stands on. When you, the writer, first enter the city of Gildegarn, the capital city of hunters, the initial tension of riding through with a monster friend in tow is real, and continues through the first half of the game. You also visit a respectful amount of towns throughout the game, pretty much one for almost every region that you visit, and they are really cool to just walk around in and take in the scenery. Scenery is a high point in this game for me. Stories makes me feel relaxed when traveling, gathering materials, and getting my bearings around the several fields that make up the world. The fields are really pretty, and each have their own flavor to them, like the snow fields, the desert, the volcano, and I find some of them to be better than others. To be honest, the fields where I wasn't able to fly over it were my favorite. Simply the realization that ground traversal is fluff for a certain field, instead of required, making you learn how to get from one place to another, possibly utilizing other abilities at your disposal, removes some of the magic the initial step into the field has. For instance, after I attained the ability to fly, I never traveled across the first field, Pondry Hills, or Monson Plains a little later on, on foot anymore. And I especially didn't for the desert, as that has a lot of empty ground to cover between its two resting areas. But I mentioned abilities and getting around, so let's talk about the monsters themselves. Sure, flying on the back of a Rathalos or other flying wyvern, wyvern is fun, but you will need other monsters on your team for various purposes, like jumping across gaps, climbing vines, digging into the earth, getting across lava, as well as searching for various materials in the wild. As a rider, you have the ability to be a little shit to a monster's habitat and waltz into their den and steal their eggs, otherwise known as I'm mommy to these babies now. They imprint to me, the rider. And depending on the markings of a specific egg you pick up, a different monster will hatch from it to add to your roster. And here is where the Pokemon aspect comes in. You want to catch them all, or in this case, hatch them all. 
and try them out and see what they do. The amount of detail the developers put into each monster, including their animations, each of them have their own sleeping animations by the by, and special attacks, which are a treat to watch, is so commendable. And eventually you will piece together a well-rounded team of different elements, powers, and utility abilities for outside of battle. But what do you do with the other monsters you hatch? You can actually sacrifice them to another monster in order to transfer a specific gene to make that monster stronger or more versatile. The game's way of showing this is actually pretty handy by changing a Legombi, a nice type monster, into one with fire type abilities. The game even addresses the ecological impact this could have on the world, and that these monsters pretty much don't pass these new genes onto the next generation. It's a nice touch I wasn't expecting, they actually addressed this problem. So with all that said, then we get into combat, which I find pretty standard. The game works on the triangle system of strengths and weaknesses, like fire emblems, cycling between power, technical, and speed attacks. Different monsters have tendencies to rely on specific types of attacks, so that when you go head-to-head -head with them, in the style of a duel, you either win, draw, or lose, taking and dealing damage accordingly. Even when incorporating status effects, buffs, debuffs, and coordinating double attacks to increase your kinship during battle, I found the combat fairly easy. It gets even easier if you spend enough time channeling genes into your monsters to make unstoppable tanks steamrolling throughout the game. But I find fun in the combat when customizing my character's fighting style. With Monster Hunter, choosing which weapon you want to use is important, and Stories encourages you to try all of its weapon types, including sword-shield combos, great swords, and hammers. My personal favorite was actually the Hunting Horn, allowing for special effects to happen after a certain combination of attacks. All of the weapons and armor look really cool, which made me want to try as many weapons as I was able to, and getting more special attacks for each weapon type as the game went on, continued to build my enthusiasm for the game. There are so many side quests in this game too, although with little variety. Most of them involve gathering materials or defeating a certain monster, but a big issue for me was thinking that more side quests opened up after a certain story beat, so I would stop everything and do laps around everywhere that had NPCs, but sure enough, my hunches were correct. It just does not help that the Monster Hunter flow of gathering and defeating monsters gets in the way of trying to tell an overarching story. Because I tend to spend so much time screwing around, I was 30 hours in, and I just got to the point where a titular character returned from the prologue, and I thought to myself, I really should have been here sooner. This happened multiple times, especially when you get your key monster for the story, a one-eyed Rathalos named Rava. I kept saying to myself, Hey, remember that time 40 hours ago and nothing has come of that moment until now? What I'm saying is my own playing pace and the game's structure and story really putted heads, which got in the way of a cohesive story. There is a lot to like about Monster Hunter Stories though, especially since it is not exclusive to just the 3DS. Stories is also available on Android and iOS for around $20 last time I checked, which is well worth it for close to or over a hundred hours of content. Sure, you can't use the really cool amiibos that Stories got in Japan only, but there is a lot there regardless. There is even updates and DLC that was added in for additional offline tournaments, monsters, and Legend of Zelda gear in the 3DS version, which means that you can actually fight with Epona, and it's great, but I do want to mention something. Monster Hunter Stories did drop support outside of Japan a little over a year after its initial release. That was just because it did not sell well outside of Japan, unfortunately. However, Japan continued to receive updates with additional monsters and other content. So if you're interested, and want to play on mobile, you might want to seek out the Japanese release, if you're okay with not knowing what they're saying or what's going on. Picross 3D Round 2? and Picross 3D 1. I'm going to talk about these two games in the order that I played them in. First round 2, then the first game, just to give you my full perspective here. These might be the only Picross games I play this year, as the only one I have left is Picross DS, and this year I wanted to get away from Jupiter's Picross titles, because if you watch my 2018 list, playing through a lot of Jupiter's titles in a short period of time is not a great idea. So, enter HAL Laboratory. Yes, that studio, and their 3D entries into Picross. 
which I find to be more challenging and mindful compared to the regular 2D Picross. Maybe it's feeling like a sculptor working with marble, I don't know. I started with round 2, because I don't have an excuse, and I realize there is a certain trend with 3DS games having a cafe-style environment. It really fits the handheld, honestly, unlike my kind of giant hands. I find that the 3D puzzles are easier to read as well compared to the 2D ones, where I eventually felt like I was playing Minesweeper by the end of it. The 3D puzzles allow for more angles to attack the puzzle from, meaning that if you hit a standstill, you could find another area that is opened up based on previous actions. Round 2 also groups puzzles by various themes, which helps organize everything neatly. This includes a separate amiibo section, which, if you have the appropriate amiibo, gives you a puzzle based on that amiibo. I was able to do all of them, but I will say that those puzzles feel half-heartedly put in, as the finished puzzles, and even while you chip away at them, don't fit the same style as the rest of the main puzzles. Round 2, and also the first game, have a respectable amount of puzzles, and unconsciously, the games recommend that you do one puzzle a day, as they do have close to 365 puzzles, but that only works if you knew how many puzzles there were ahead of time. I will mention that there is a six year difference between the first and second game, which leads to a fair amount of change in quality of life. Talking about the first game, it feels rather bare bones compared to the cafe style elegant presentation of round two, but does come with a mascot of sorts. This, well, thing? And honestly, I want to know, can someone tell me if this thing is in Smash in any way? Because that would be amazing if it were true. Compared to Round 2, 3D1, or however you want to call it, does not group puzzles by theme, at least not in the same way. It only groups them after you solve them, so you simply go in blind every time. Both games have a ranking system as well, but Round 2's is way more lenient compared to 3D1. Some puzzles in Round 2 will allow for one or two mistakes on your part and still give you a Platinum Diamond Medal, the highest award, but 3D1 has no leniency. One mistake, and you lose out on getting three stars in the puzzle required to unlock two additional puzzles in each set. Finally, one big comparison between the two is how they handle zero blocks. In Picross, you inevitably will get puzzles that you can ignore certain rows and columns, or mark them so that you don't accidentally make a mistake in an obvious spot. In 3D, however, to finish a puzzle, you need to remove all unnecessary blocks. In Round 2, a time-saving option was added, a literal bomb almost, which removes all zero blocks for you automatically with no penalty. This option is not in 3D1, and wow did I miss it when I finished Round 2. I don't think I realized how much time I was saving with an option like that until I was on the more intricate puzzles, carefully chipping away at zero blocks, and a minute had passed on the clock, and I had not even started on the puzzle yet. What I do miss and wish still existed for 3D1 though, is the ability to download and share user-made puzzles. But since Nintendo took that feature down, 3D1 lost that edge, so now both games are good for solely the main puzzles. Round 2 doesn't even have an online sharing feature. However, even after all this time, Picross 3D is still the more affordable of the two. If you're lucky, you can find it for as little as 10 bucks Canadian, but Round 2 is digital only on the 3DS eShop, where it is still around 50 Canadian dollars with tax. The only thing I can recommend if you're looking for a round 2 cheaper is if you have a My Nintendo Rewards account, because if you have some coins laying around, you might want to check if there is a coupon for round 2. Generally, there sometimes is. That coupon has generally been for 40% off of round 2's price, but that has been the lowest that I've seen available for it. So if you're interested in one of those two options, I'd give it a shot. 3D is actually really good. Nintendo Land The Wii U is probably going to be the last console to have a great game bundled with it. Nintendo Land oozes fun, color, and joy out of all of its attractions, and I really like how Nintendo creatively showcases the capabilities of their consoles with games like this. Say what you want about 1-2 Switch, but it does show the capabilities of the Joy-Cons. But Nintendo Land has so much more depth to it, 
within a majority of its games, from Zelda's combination of what I refer to as a rail shooter with fabric and plush aesthetics similar to good field games like Kirby's Epic Yarn and Yoshi's Woolly World, to Pikmin, to Donkey Kong's Crash Course, and all of the things that actually go into that tilting, frustrating nightmare that it can sometimes become, and even the closest thing to an F-Zero game we've gotten in years. Nintendo Land is just fun. If you have a dusty Wii U, probably you have Nintendo Land on it. Play it. You'll find something good in it. Mario Pinball Land. This might be the worst game I've played this year. It is certainly the worst Mario game I've ever played. And the award for these statements goes to Fuse Games. Pinball Land barely has story, but definitely demonstrates that Mario is an outstanding idiot who would rather be turned into a ball and thrown around than stand on his feet to go through doors like a normal person. Because that was one of the biggest frustrations in this game for me, is just the pinball. The pinball mechanics are questionable at best, with Mario accelerating like crazy if left unchecked, and being stuck in one room trying to open a specific door to get to a new star challenge for 20 minutes is not fun, and not entertaining to show. This game also shows my extreme lack of luck, as there is a few challenges that expect you to be lucky in the pathing of your ball within a time limit, or unlocking additional areas and bosses through interacting with specific objects, so, you know, just good luck on your part. I can't remember a time where I've been more infuriated with a game. Everything can be going fine, and then you're one hit away from defeating a boss, and then the acceleration gets carried away and blasts you through the paddles, sending you back to the previous room, or completing an event but leaving the room before you collect the star because you're not allowed to save your reward, or realizing maybe you shouldn't use the items that are supposed to give you an edge in completing challenges because instead they work against you or kill you faster despite the amount of protection they should give, there is nothing worthwhile this game possesses. As the conflict is two Goombas no one was paying attention to blasting Peach out of a cannon, play any other Mario game. Not this one. Kirby's Extra Epic Yarn I remember way back in 2010, when Epic Yarn first released on the Wii, that there was a huge hubbub about the game being too easy. Kirby can't die, you only lose beads, and apart from a few circumstances, you can get gold medals on stages with no issues. I was not expecting to play through extra Epic Yarn this quickly, but here we are, I guess. Maybe I'll play more than one game in its release year, because this is the only one so far. Extra Epic Yarn is, at the time of this video, the last 3DS game that Nintendo is publishing, and I agree with a lot of the reviews and opinions that are out about this game. It is a weird port, seemingly adding and subtracting an equal amount of things and not using the 3DS to its fullest. Extra removes co-op, so Prince Fluff is not playable, there is no 3D capability to show off some sweet yarn effects, and also control schemes are switched slightly, like the tank being unable to rotate its arms due to motion controls, but could have been used with gyro controls. And the additions are a mixed bag. Going back to difficulty, there's now the devilish mode, where an annoying devil will appear ever so often in stage and try to do you harm. It also introduces hit points and encourages no hit runs to get prizes for every five pieces of star you leave a stage with, but even then it's lenient. Prince Fluff gives beads, or powers in stages, and in devilish mode gives a full heal, so you really just need to get through half the stage without getting hit. And speaking of which, Kirby copy abilities are back in a way, with six yarn and crafting adjacent abilities. Kirby got none of these abilities in the original release, which was kind of a trade-off for the difficulty. But now it makes the game actually far easier. If you want to make the game insultingly easy, use nothing but the nylon power. You become a tornado with a gigantic hitbox, making almost every enemy in the game pointless, even bosses, except for Yin Yarn, the final boss, and the tornado sucks up nearby beads for you, leading to easy gold medals. It's fun having the copy abilities like Sword, a little bit of Ninja, and Bomb, but the powers annihilate the level in some cases, especially in platforming. And then there is the two extra modes, Meta Knight Slash and Bead and DDD Go Go Go. 
Each mode has four stages involving constant slashing with Meta Knight, or the next iteration of DDD running a lot collecting things, in this case, Fuse Beads, or what I would like to refer to as Perler Beads. There is not much to mention with each mode, honestly, but the goal is to collect enough Fuse Beads to get high ranks in each stages to unlock patterns to create new designs. The big problem with these modes is that they introduce grinding in a Kirby game, which I have not experienced before, honestly, because you do not get nearly enough Fuse Beads to create half of the patterns in one go. One of the patterns requires a maximum, or 999, Fuse beads in one color, and there are a lot of colors, as well as special Lumina fuse beads that dot designs. It wears the modes thin, having to do them over and over and keep getting the highest rank in them, and they're already thin enough to begin with. But if you've never played Epic Yarn before and want to play it on the go, this is actually kind of your only option. But you can still purchase the original on the Wii U eShop if you still want to play with a friend. Getting over it with Bennett Foddy. Oh, hi. It's that. Yeah, I, I played it, and somehow got through it. This resulted in several failures, of course, and a lot of luck in order to get across things like Orange Hell in the bucket, and while it causes a numerous amount of emotional and mental pain on people, the big thing I took away from this was that you get better every time you fall. I was thinking of God Hand actually going up the first section of the mountain again and again, because I realized that I was taking a shorter amount of time to climb that first section over and over. It doesn't stop my palms from being sweaty or my hands shaking for pressure and hoping my success is not ripped away from me, but there is a lesson to be learned in all things, I guess. You can learn them from other things, though. Not this. A bird story. There is not much here for me to discuss, because a bird story is more of an interactive story than an actual game. The main gameplay features are moving at specific instances, giving you a small amount of agency, and also interface features that are more for show than having a practical use. But playing a game is not why you open a bird story. You're there for a story, which includes a bird, and that's what you get. And you also get a good story at that. What I enjoy in experiences like this is taking advantage of what you decide to create your project with, and seeing creativity in the limitations of what you use. Having a story told with no dialogue, and only through subtle movements of sprite characters, and still getting me invested into the relationships the characters have with one another speaks volumes of how well all the cogs in this proverbial machine work. Play slash watch a bird story. Gunpoint I think what makes Gunpoint really good is that it is not overly complicated. It is quick to pick up how every mechanic works, from the wire hacking to each guard type, especially when hovering over with the cursor reveals more information about how things interact with one another. Accessibility of information is a strength in Gunpoint, and the concise yet detailed story that the game takes you through blends into the gameplay as well. The biggest problem people run into with the game is the inability to reload the gun you can eventually include in your arsenal of tools. But when the story deals with illegal gun smuggling, and the lack of available firearms, it's actually a smart inclusion. The whole game is really smart, allowing you to dictate how you carry out jobs, whether you be a ghost, leaving no one alive, or be the loudest person in the world who somehow succeeds every time. And with the inclusion of a level editor, those who have an itch to create more complex, expansive locations to carry out missions, including moving through multiple buildings and underground bunkers, can take advantage of it. Gunpoint is just good. Please, play it if you haven't. Defunct There are things to like about Defunct. First off, it does what it wanted to do. Tell a concise story. Maybe not even a story, though. You play a robot just looking to repair itself on the ship that it's on, accidentally falls through the garbage chute to the planet below, and then makes a mad dash to try to get back to the ship. This game takes about an hour to get through, and for a quote story like that, it does what it needs to. What can make the game longer is the journey, though. Seeing the sights and failing at the controls. 
The gameplay is a series of open playgrounds encouraging fast-paced movement based on momentum and maintaining speed. On top of a boost meter and speed boosts, speed also comes from gravity abilities the robot possesses and taking advantage of downward slopes. Timing is key in this case, and it's the difference between the fun time and the grueling slog getting to the next downhill slope. I can't really recommend this game though, as this kind of experience is really for a small audience of people, and I'm not really one of those people. I have no interest to really return to this game to get better to get some of the more crazy place collectibles, and the time trials I can honestly do without as well. I just want to make the robot happy, and I guess it kind of did at the end. And this is the end of the list of 2019 games so far. The remainder will be covered probably at the end of the year, maybe a little bit into January. Again, any other games that I've played but were not covered in this list have a separate video slash videos in the 2019 playlist. For instance, I played through all of Asura's Wrath this year. It's so good. And I went through the entire game and showed it off in four videos. If you want to see what other games I have played as well or are currently playing, I keep track of my game collection through the use of backloggery.com. Link in the description as well. So with that, thanks for watching. See you next time, everyone.